intention tonight was to take you through a tour um, of our museum. But, um, and uh, when I decided this is what I was going to do, I, I was uh, thinking, first of all, how do people visit museums? And, and uh, I mean, sometimes people go to museums just to see one particular object, like the Mona Lisa. And so you'll see hundreds of people clicking their cameras without really looking at the object, and then they get home and look at the photographs. Then you get people who want to see beautiful objects. M maybe they don't know too much about them, but they'll just go around looking at exquisite craftsmanship and, and so on. And then you get people interested in culture or in a particular country, and so they'll visit a museum for that reason. When I was at university in London, uh, if I had nothing to do on a Sunday afternoon, I'd just go to the British Museum. It was nice. It had a nice atmosphere. Just wander around. I like the Mesopotamian galleries, so just wandered around there. It gave me a good feeling. When in our museum, um, I've seen people, all sorts of people. I've seen people who have been through the museum in 10 minutes, you know, and say, that was fantastic. And, and I've seen people sit in one gallery for hours uh, really hours on end, and then they come back and they make repeated visits to the museum. And, um, and I've always thought, uh, why not, um, if people were strapped for time, as so many people who come to our museum are, they come in, a lot of visitors to Kuwait are here, they've got, say, half an hour, one hour, and uh, I thought it might be a good idea to take people through uh, different sections of the museum and uh, focus on, say, three, four items, and maybe learn a little bit about an interesting object and have maybe a general idea about that particular medium, say ceramics or manuscripts. So that's what I'm going to do tonight. Um, and uh, my intention was to do a tour of 20 items in the museum. And then I struggled to keep it down to 20 because it went up to 26 and I brought it down a little. So I've kept it to 20, but there's 25 there just in case. And when I did the first um, run through, it took 45, 50 minutes to do 10 items. So I had to chop, 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 and here we go. <laughs> and I have 45 minutes, right? Okay. That's my pointer. And I always point the pointer at the screen, and I don't need to, do I? <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start off, I mean, originally I was going to start off with a really interesting door that we have in the museum, and it's one of the first things you see when you come into the museum corridor on the right, it's a, a big door called the Sultan Barqouq door, but I've decided to move that along because there's quite a lot to say about it. So if we have time at the end, I'll talk about that. And that, that, the, um, one of the interesting about, things about that door is that Dr. Geza spent a huge amount of time going through an adventure of research about that door. So instead, I'm going to start off, uh, oh, and just to go back, backtrack a little bit. The items I've chosen are not necessarily the most valuable or the most significant items in our museum. Um, some of them are just things that I like. Uh, some of them are things that I've noticed people like looking at, and some of them are just things which have uh, a nice, interesting story. So it's uh, a mix. And what we're going to start with tonight is this rug which is hanging again in the entrance which is a 19th century rug uh, from Isfahan. And uh, in the rug are 54 historic world characters, uh, each with a number. And um, around the border, there are little circles with, uh, as you'll see here, with um, the number and the name of the character. And in, in this case, number 51 on the left is uh, uh, Washington of America. And uh, the one on the right is written backwards. I haven't actually been able to work it out, but um, I think the, the weaver must have been a person who couldn't read or write, because he must have had the pattern upside down or something, yeah, or dyslexic. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting rug, and um, it was from the early to the mid-19th century, um, and it was uh, in the possession of a, an Indian Maharaja's uh, family for a hundred years. We don't know where it came from before that, but I feel that this is a rug that was um, made for perhaps the Western market, because there, there are so many Western characters in it, rather than Middle Eastern ones. So you have people, okay, who are famous, but not one of the, the most famous characters in the world, like Vasco da Gama and Magellan, 
but here we have Moses, and we have um, many interesting characters like Moses and King Solomon, who follows there, and Romulus, who founded Rome, and, and um, there are people like Charlemagne, Harun al-Rashid, Confucius, and George Washington over there. So it's a, character, it's a rug full of very interesting characters and nicely done. And, um, but the, the one thing I thought was interesting about this rug is that Alexander the Great, one of the most important characters to Europe and to the Middle East, is not there. And I, I'm sure it's because the Persians don't really like Alexander the Great, having burnt Persepolis. So he's not in there. And um, at the top, we have um, an interesting um, inscription, and it says something about um, images of great world characters who are famed for their works or their minds. So that's a nice carpet. And we're going to move from that, and we're going to go into um, the manuscript area. We've got many fantastic manuscripts. Um, we have pages, we have books, um, we have Qur'ans, we have books on science and uh, mathematics and atlases from all periods of Islamic history, starting from around the first, second century up to more recent times, and for all, from all geographical areas, from Indonesia, China, up to North Africa and Spain. Now, um, uh, just a little bit about Arabic writing briefly. Now, Arabic writing, um, scholars agree, descends from Nabateo Aramaic writing, which in turn comes down from the uh, Phoenician alphabet. As you know, the Nabateans spoke a dialect of Arabic. And um, the earliest, I mean, Arabic only really started pro getting properly written down when the Quran was revealed, so in the seventh century. But there are examples of Arabic. Um, for example, this one, um, which is one of the earliest ones, uh, 250 AD, and, and you can actually make out, um, you know, read some things there. And um, this is the most famous one, probably, which is from the tombstone of Emir al-Qais, um, a very famous Arabian character, and so on until um, uh, the 500s, there, the sixth century, uh, where you have, again, this quite readable um, script. And that's courtesy of uh, Safadi. So when the Quran was revealed, um, one of the earliest scripts was called the Kufic Abbasid script. And, and this is a, a, a fantastic example of a very early um, manuscript with Kufic Abbasid script um, written on parchment. And this dates from the first, second century Hijri which is the 7th, 8th uh, century AD. And um, it's interesting, as you'll see in the next manuscript too, that at that time, um, the letter Elif in Arabic was written with a, you know, a curve to the right. And um, this is considered a, a very fine example of the writing at the time, a beautiful uh, example of writing. And it's an extremely significant piece because very little has survived from that period uh, and, in, um, and with the writings so clear as that. So that's a very special piece. And, and the particular type of writing there is called ma'il, which in, in, uh, in English means bent. It's called the bent style of the Kufic Abbasid script. Now, um, the next one we have is also written in early Kufic Abbasid, and it's um, a folio from North Africa. Um, 8th century, written in beautiful um, um, Kufa Kapasid script, and again, um, you can see the elif with the, the curve to the right, and apparently calligraphers, I'm not a calligrapher, but apparently can, calligraphers consider the way this fee is written uh, to be quite uh, splendid. And, um, uh, this Kufic writing is quite difficult to read because in Arabic there are a lot of uh, markings, diacritical marks they're called, and in early Kufic writing they weren't there. So you didn't have the dots and the lines that, that developed later. So another very interesting piece. Now next we have something which has nothing to do with religion. This is a book written by Al-Kindi. And Al-Kindi, or as he's known in the West, Al-Kindis, was uh, um, born in Baghdad, in Kufa, in 800 AD, and he worked closely with the court. He were, um, the caliphs were his patrons. 
And he was a philosopher and a chemist and a pharmacologist and an astronomer and a mathematician and he was, you name it, he, he was that. He wrote books on music, on cookery, on swordsmanship, on everything. He was a real renaissance man of his time and his period. And um, he was a scientist who had much influence on later scientists, Arab scientists like Ibn al-Haytham. And um, uh, Ibn al-Haytham is, some scholars argue, I mean, some might argue that he's not, but some scholars do argue that Ibn al-Haytham was the most important physicist in history until Newton came along, so hundreds of years. Anyway, um, al-Kindi um, wrote a lot on uh, optics, and this book is called The Book of the Science of Rays of Light and Burning Mirrors, for which he's famous. And um, it's very interesting that when we had this book studied, and there were some scholars who studied it. One of them was called Rushdi Rashid. Um, the scholar um, stated that until this book came to light, this particular edition, which was uh, um, written in the ninth century, until this book came to light, the only known edition of this version of Al Kindi's work was a 1485 Mamluk edition. And that's how this work was known to the world. And then they studied this book, and um, they did a lot of research on it. And there were two scripts written on the back. One of them, the top one, dated to um, uh, yeah. But I mean, the important one is uh, is this one actually, the one on the bottom. That was dated this one to not long after the book was written, but this one was dated to 890. And it says here that this was It gives the name of the person who copied this book in the year 890 Hijri, and um, and that's the name Al Fayyumi. And and the scholars all agreed that this is none other than the 1485 Mamluk edition. So it's extremely interesting that the book that's been known for hundreds of years um, to the world from the 1485 edition was actually copied from this. Uh, book of Al-Kindi. So that's a book worth looking at. Now next we come to a, a really, uh, another really important book by Ibn Sina. And um, Ibn Sina um, Avicenna, as he's known in the West, um, is considered by everyone the most important writer on medicine in the world until the 1700s. And all through the Middle East from um, the 1100s when he wrote the book, the 11th century when he wrote the book until the 1700s, his book has been used as the encyclopedia at all universities across Middle East and Europe. And it formed, um, Ibn Sina's book, the core syllabus of the medicine um, course at the University of Montpellier in France in the 1700s. Um, the reason his book is so important and was so valued for 700 years is that, um, like Al Kindi did, he gathered the works of the ancient Greeks, of the Persians, of the Indians, all these cultures, and as Kindi did, he not only translated them into Arabic, he also developed the sciences further. So they weren't mere tra uh, translators, Al-Kindi, Ibn al-Haytham, and, and Ibn Sina. They were people who developed the science much further. And, um, and everything is written in very concise, clear detail with uh, excellent illustrations. And so this is a book that's been, that's been of vital importance to the whole world for hundreds and hundreds of years. So another very interesting book to have a look at. Um, Next, we come to, see, I've got muddled up here, um, a very interesting uh, writer who's an extremely important calligrapher in the Islamic world, but I like his story, which is why I've got it here, Yaqut al-Mustasumi, who's a, a famous calligrapher who was a slave to um, the caliph al-Mustasum, who was the last caliph in Baghdad before Baghdad was sacked by the Mongols in 1258. And, um, uh, Al-Mustahsumi, interestingly, was taught by a woman, 
a famous woman calligrapher called Shuhada bint al-Ibari, and she was in the direct line of uh, one of the most famous and earliest of Arab calligraphers, writers, who was uh, Ibn al-Bawwab, uh, who in turn came down from Ibn Muqla, who was, um, I suppose, the progenitor of classical Arabic script. And so, um, one of the things he did was to refine Ibn al-Bawwab's work and um, to put certain rules down. So he developed things further. For example, in Arabic calligraphy, you, have, you use dots with your pen to uh, make spaces, and he developed um, that into a fine art. And um, this is a, a, a Qur'an written by Yaqut al-Mustasami, and he wrote in his lifetime around 364 copies of the Qur'an. And at the back of the book, um, it says, um, written by Yaqut al-Mustasumi in the year 1282, well, it has the Hijri year, but I'm, I'm giving the, the AD one, 1282 AD, in the city of peace, which is Baghdad. Now, the interesting story about uh, Yaqut al-Mustasumi is that when the Mongols were sacking and ravaging and burning and murdering people and everybody in Baghdad, he ran up a minaret and sought refuge up in the minaret so that he could continue writing um, one of his copies of the Quran, I presume. He was taken, in, he was taken into custody. He wasn't murdered. He was um, captured by the Mongols, and he served under the Mongols, who were his patrons, until he died. And he produced, yes, a phenomenal number of um, Qurans in his life. Next, we have a, another really interesting, beautiful book by. Um, Hamdallah al-Amasi. Now, al-Amasi was born in northern Anatolia in a town called uh, Amasya, and he worked for the, um, the ruling family, the Ottomans, and um, his patron was Mehmet uh, the Conqueror, and he was a tutor to his son Bayazid, who eventually became the Sultan in Constantinople. Um, now, um, once um, they moved to Constantinople, he, he had an extremely privileged position in the court, and it was said that he was held in such high regard by the ruling family, including the Sultan, that they would hold his inkwell for him when he, he wrote his, his books. And this is an exquisite example of illumination and calligraphy in Eskhi script. And, um, and this, um, I mean, uh, Amasi, uh, it is said, wrote around 50 copies of the Qur'an. Um, not many of them survive. There are a few in Turkish museums. Um, this is a very nice uh, edition from 1501. A beautiful book to look at. Now here we have uh, an illustration, a beautiful one, um, which is called the Horton Shahnama. Now, this um, is written by a very famous painter, calligrapher from Persia called um, Muzaffar Ali. And he, he was uh, the student of a, an even more famous um, uh, painter called uh, Behzad, um, although a lot of people say he surpassed Behzad in, in the exquisiteness of his works. And he was working for the Emperor Tahmas. Um, who commissioned this book, which is the um, Shahnama of, by, of Ferdowsi, and it was um, uh, completed and presented in 1568 by the Shah to the Sultan Salim II upon his accession to the throne in uh, Constantinople, in Istanbul. Um, in 1970, well, um, this from 1568 until the early 20th century, it was in the possession of the Topkapi Palace, and in the early, early 20th century, it was bought by um, Edmund de Rothschild, who had it in his possession in turn until the 1950s when he sold it to an American billionaire called Arthur Horton. Now, Horton offered this manuscript to, Shah, to the Shah of Iran in 1976. Apparently, the Shah refused because he was asking too much money. So. Um, and then this coupled with the fact that people say Arthur Horton took out some of the pages of the Shahnama to present to the Metropolitan Museum of Art as a way of avoiding paying taxes. And then he took apart the whole book and put them up for auction uh, at uh, Christie's in London, shocking the whole art world. And, um, and so this illustration comes from that 
book, which is considered a, a world-class work of art everywhere in the world in terms of the exquisiteness of the illustration and the calligraphy, the illumination, even the paper, uh, everything about it is of the, the absolute highest quality. And in this um, illustration, we have the emperor um, Yazdegerd, who had um, a health ailment and a violent nosebleed, so he went to this magic pond to cure his uh, nosebleed. And when he was there, this uh, magic horse came out and kicked him to death. And he's seen here um, watching his retainers try to hold back the magic horse. Um, as you know, the Shahnama is the story of the Persian Book of Kings. Uh, next, we have another very interesting story called the Tutinama, written by, uh, again, a very famous artist calligrapher from um, northern India in, um, in the 1500s. Uh, this is 1580, this edition. Now, the Tutinama, this Tutinama was commissioned by the Emperor Ak Akbar in um, uh, the Mughal Empire, and apparently during his reign there were two editions um, commissioned. Uh, one which was uh, written in the 1560s and is now in the Cle Cleveland Museum of Art, and it's almost complete. And um, then this one which we have from 1580, um, of which we have some pages, and uh, it's from the 1580 edition by um, Ziauddin Nakhshabi. Now, Nakhshabi wrote uh, this in Persian, but he took the stories from the original Indian stories. And the Tutinama, or the Tales of a Parrot, is about this woman whose merchant husband goes away on a long trip, and when he goes away, she decides she would like to go and meet her paramour. And, but she decides to consult her parrot before she goes. And the parrot tells her a very interesting story that night, and so she stays at home. And like Shahrazad tales, um, every night he tells her a very interesting story for 52 nights until her husband comes home, and thus preserving her fidelity. So that's the story of the Tutinama. Okay, and now we can leave the manuscripts and the, um, the books, and, oh, sorry, that was an, another page of the Tutinama and go to the ceramic section. And I've got here a, a Hispano Moresque bowl from Spain. Now, we've got ceramics in the museum from everywhere again, like the manuscripts from west to east, north to south, and from all periods. We've got manuscripts from, I mean, uh, ceramics from um, the earliest periods of Islam right up into much more recent times. Um, when the Arabs established the Islamic empire, they inherited from the vast lands that they conquered, they inherited multiple ceramic making centers in Mesopotamia, in Syria, in Egypt, in, in Persia, all over um, the Islamic world. And so they inherited techniques and they also took in techniques from the Chinese who had been constantly passing on um, ceramics methods. And they also invented uh, many methods in the Islamic world, including stone paste, tin glazing, fritware, and lusterware. And many of these, for hundreds of years, the Middle East had acted as a, uh, a stopping off point for techniques from China, also techniques that were born in the region and then passed on to European ceramic makers, like many of the famous types of ceramics that you have now in Spain and in Italy. Now, um, I, I'm focusing quite a bit here on lustreware because I think lustreware is one of the biggest inventions uh, in the Middle East, and there's a lot of argument over whether it was invented in Egypt or in, in um, Iraq. Um, some people say Egypt because the earliest piece of lustreware that survives is from Egypt, but others disagree and say Iraq. But whichever, um, the fact is that wherever it was invented very quickly, it soon spread to the rest of the Islamic world. Now, um, it spread, of course, from the Eastern Islamic world, the Middle East, up to North Africa. And they say, uh, scholars say that um, the earliest appearance of uh, lusterware in North Africa or the Western Islamic world was in Qairawan. And, uh, in the great mosque of Qairawan and in the uh, uh, palace of Raqqada, 
uh, near there. And so a lot of ceramicists must have come there from um, the Eastern Islamic world, set up their industries, and then when Khairawan was sacked in the 11th century, um, a lot of the potters emigrated um, to the Mediterranean coasts of uh, Algeria and Tunisia. And then um, it is said that their descendants eventually crossed the seas to Spain and established uh, um, ceramics and lustreware centers in Malaga, which was the main one, uh, plus Almeria and uh, Murcia, in uh, uh, Andalusia, of course. And um, so here we have a, a very beautiful Hispano Moresque ware with the cobalt and blue lustreware. And um, uh, it's got four sort of handles on the side. Now there's a very similar one in the VNA uh, missing the four handles. And this is uh, definitely identified as Malaga ware because it has the Malaga stamp on the bottom of it. And uh, scholars all agree that the shape is a, a typical Malaga. Um, next, we'll come something which, again, is not in chronological order. We're going back to the 10th century here, to um, Fatimid Egypt. And what's interesting and significant about this jar is that um, there are three figures on it. Um, and here we have one of the figures. You can just about make out the figure. And the figure's holding a flag, and on the flag it says, Amaluhu um, Betar. I think it's Betar in Arabic. And uh, Betar is uh, um, one of three famous potters of that time, uh, who included, uh, apart from himself, uh, another potter called Muslim and another potter called Ibrahim. And um, so um, there are several examples of their work that still exist, including in the Kerr Collection in London and the Freer Gallery in the States. And so uh, this is quite a significant piece of uh, early Fatimid lustreware. And then we go on to something which I just like myself. Again, it's a, it's a Fatimid bowl um, from the 10th, late 10th, early 11th century um, Egypt again. And, but there are, there's quite a bit of uh, um, Iraqi symbolism in there, including these are typical Mesopotamian symbols, the almond shapes. That's a lynx or a lion. And the writing um, in the border it goes all around, says, Tawakkul Tukfa, which people translate as trust in God. And then finally we're jumping um, a couple of centuries, but um, we're going to Turkey now. And um, Turkey has always had a ceramics industry and, uh, the, or a pottering industry, and the pottery there was usually made of uh, red earthenware until... Um, until Influences started coming in from other parts of the Middle East, Syria um, and Persia and uh, Mesopotamia. And a lot of techniques were brought in when the Seljuks um, came to Anatolia. Um, this is, this is a, a very famous piece of pottery which is called Iznik ware. And it comes from a region um, in what the Greeks called Nyakia, called Iznik. And um, this is where many people consider the apex of Islamic uh, ceramics developed, where they started new, using new underglazing and faience. Um, techniques were taken from the Chinese, um, uh, as well as techniques that, uh, the techniques that were taken from Mesopotamia and Syria and Persia. And generally, Iznik ware is divided. I mean, this is a particularly fine example um, of uh, later Iznik ware from around the 1560s. But here, we have one of the early ones in which you can see a lot of Chinese uh, blue and white influence. And Iznik ware uh, is basically divided into th three periods. And the first period, which was 1495 to around 1525, is called the Abraham of Kutahia period. And uh, most of the, the, the ware that came from that period was blue and white with heavy Chinese influence. And then you have the second period, uh, 1525 to around 1555, which is called the Damascus period, where greens and, and uh, reds, uh, greens and purples were introduced. And finally, you have the, the period called the Rhodian period, where the very distinctive uh, um, red ceiling wax color was introduced, and um, 
um, that was uh, 1555 to 1700. And so here we have a very fine example of uh, that. And this one was made during the reign of Sultan Selim II. And um, the motifs are what identify it as that. And this was around 1560. And this has got motifs and patterns which are similar to many tiles which were produced at the time um, and used by the very, very famous Turk, uh, Ottoman architect Sinan in his, uh, in his buildings. Okay, so we move from the ceramics and the Iznik into metalwork. Uh, metal now, in, as with the pottery, um, when the Arabs established the Islamic empire over this vast region, they inherited metalwork centers in Persia, and Mesopotamia, and Syria, um, in Egypt, all over the place. And as with ceramics, they combined techniques, they invented new methods. And um, in the early days, uh, their styles weren't very distinctive in terms of uh, being an Islamic object. Um, they tended to use the styles that had been used previously. So uh, then there became a change in the use of metals so while um, pre-Islamic, there was a lot of gold and silver used, especially in the courts, later on they started to prefer, of course, um, depending on the period, um, bronze or brass, although there were courts in later Islamic period which um, obviously went for the silver and gold as well. Now one of the earliest, um, we've got a, a big range of uh, metalwork in the museum, ranging again from very early periods until much more recent times and a uh, wide geographical area. And one of the earliest pieces we have, or um, we've got some of, are these, uh, is uh, like this Umayyad incense burner, which comes from Syria in the seventh century with very strong Byzantine influence. Next we come into um, Rezni Lion, we call it, which uh, was researched by Geza. He did a lot of research on this. And um, um, what's interesting about this, I mean, it's identified as Rezni because, uh, maybe I'll move on, because you can see um, here some symbols like the palmettes plus other hexagonal symbols, symbols and these were very distinctive of uh, the palace in Rezni at the time, which was around the 11th century. And also interesting here is that um, it's signed by the person who made it. It says there, Amala Ali. And there's a, there are several, um, there are some similar lynxes or lions as, as this one. Uh, as you can see, it's got a hinge there so that the, the head could be reverted and the incense and the charcoal put inside. Um, yeah, so there are, there are uh, lynxes like this in museums, but they tend to be much smaller. This one is quite large. It's half a meter high, it's half a meter long. And the closest one to this, in fact, is a lion. I don't have a picture of it, but uh, is a lion which was, which is in the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg, and which was uh, incidentally um, exhibited here in Kuwait, as I'm sure Sheikh Hassa will know in 1990 during the Hermitage exhibition in, um, in the National Museum. And the other similarity with the um, her Hermitage uh, lynx, which is a similar size as these two fish on, on the side of the face. And, and also, um, the Hermitage one is also signed by Ali, but in that case, giving the full name Ali, and scholars can't decide whether it's Ali al-Taji or Ali al-Tahi. And yes, so um, what? And the other interesting thing about this is that, um, sorry, we'll go back a bit. Um, Rezni um, was a vast kingdom which stretched all through Persia and Afghanistan, but all around and within there were these little Buddhist and Hindu enclaves. Um, and so there is a lot of Buddhist symbolism in this, like the eternal knot, and. Um, plus other things, and I'll show you when we get to this other Rezni incense burner, which is, is also very interesting, and also had a lot of research um, by Dr. Geyser. Now, both of them we had analyzed in the, um, the Oxford University Materials Lab, and both of them were dated to, in that case, the 11th century, and this to the late 11th, early 12th century. Now, um, 
According to scholars, including Dr. Geza, these four lynxes are, um, in, and the dome are an imitation of the great um, Samad, Samanid Mosque in Bukhara. And now, for the Buddhist symbols, look at the Chatri on the top, which uh, Chatri is a Buddhist umbrella, and also the seated bodhisattvas that go around. And there, um, inter uh, there's some uh, Thulith writing going around the incense burner, and uh, it's interrupted by these seated figures. And there are other Buddhist symbols in, in different parts of the incense burner. Again, this one has the, the hinge on the top there, so that the, the top lifts up. Now, this one has uh, an interesting story. Uh, as I said, it was sent to Oxford for um, analysis. And um, when it was analyzed, they discovered that uh, above the bronze, there was um, a layer of uh, soot, or evidence of burning, plus a layer of calcification. So um, the deduction by Geyser, plus um, a couple of other scholars, was that when the Gurids, who were a rival dynasty at the time, sacked the Ghaznavid capital and other cities. This was probably uh, a victim of destruction and may be buried for several centuries. Who knows? It makes an interesting story anyway. And I think it's true. Now, written around the side, it says, Walbirri, Walbaraka, Waddawla, Walkarama, Walbirri, which means uh, roughly, and loyalty and divine blessing and power and divine favor and loyalty. There's quite a similar one in the Freya Gallery. I've done the... Okay. Uh, that was just the chat three on the top. Just a detail of the... Um, uh, the first picture I showed you, uh, unfortunately, somebody photoshopped for me. I didn't ask for it, but it was photoshopped. So um, it wasn't... Ac it's not actually that color. <laughs> We've had, it, uh, we've had a conservator look at it and treat it, but um, it wasn't, um, most of it is this uh, bronze green color. Uh, and now, the reason I've put this is because we're coming to something else. It's our section on uh, jewelry. And I've only chosen a few items. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry, not jewelry. I'm coming to our Fatimid lion. Now, the reason I've put this in is because during the Fatimid period in Egypt, um, they achieved exquisite heights of craftsmanship and artistry in everything, in jewelry, in cut crystal and glass, and this is a beautiful, beautiful ewer from the Kerr Collection in London, and um, many other items, chess sets, swords, everything. Um, unfortunately, there isn't a huge amount that survives from the Fatimid period, because uh, during the slave re revolt in the 12th century, a lot of uh, items were looted and destroyed, and so um, anything that survives from that period is extremely sought after, like that exquisite piece there. So I was just showing you this um, Fatimid lion, um, which again has been researched by Dr. Gaze, and, and it's um, very beautiful open work. The, the head has a hinge at the back, so that again the charcoal can be put in, and um, this is uh, one of the pieces that I like, okay. which is dated to the late 11th, the early 12th century. Okay. Now we come to another section, jewelry. And we've got a vast amount of jewelry in the museum. And I've put this dagger in. Um, I know it's not a jewel, but it's bejeweled, and it's... It's really craftsmanship of a jeweler. And this is from um, the 18th century, uh, the 17th century, sorry. It's a Mughal dagger, and um, there are fine examples of this in the Sabah collection. And um, it's beautifully set with gems and diamonds with a jade hilt and a double-edged uh, um, blade. And uh, these bejeweled daggers were symbols of rank at the time. And I've put it in there in the section of jewelry um, because it's a, a piece which I think is beautiful. Second, another significant piece to look at is this very um, beautiful Jaipur necklace which is set with um, diamonds, rubies, emeralds and pearls and so on and has a, a beautiful enamel back. And um, 
Apparently, enamel was worked onto the back because it protected uh, the, the, the piece of jewelry from the person's skin and fabrics and so on. And um, Jaipur was one of the leading centers of enamel making and jewelry making in Mughal India, um, along with uh, Varanasi and uh, Lucknow. And although many people say um, Jaipur was the leader. So that is something that I would definitely look at. Next, we have something which has got a very interesting history. Sorry, that's the Jaipur necklace again, which is this necklace from Zanzibar, or Amman. Now, this is called, we call it the Princess Salma necklace. And Princess Salma was um, born in 1844 in Zanzibar. And she had one brother who eventually became the Sultan of Oman, and another brother, or two brothers, who fought over who had become the Sultan of Zanzibar. Uh, she was involved in a lot of political intri intrigue, um, Princess Selma was, along with her sister, who pushed her away from one brother to the other. It was Sultan Barghash at the time, who was exiled to India. And uh, um, she inherited um, a lot of property from both her father and her mother. One of, the, one of her inheritances was a plantation, and she lived on this plantation, and one of her neighbors was a German merchant. Now, um, in 1866, Princess Selma eloped with this merchant. They went to Aden, got married, and then they went to Germany, where she had four children, one of whom died, two surviving daughters, one son. Unfortunately, her husband was killed in a tram accident, and she was left with three young children, very poor, and unable to go back to Oman or to Zanzibar. So she wrote a book called Memoirs of an Arabian Princess, which is probably one of the earliest autobiographies by an Arab woman. And this is um, from her book. And you can see, maybe just make out um, her wearing the, the Zanzibar. Uh, necklace. Now, um, the, this necklace was bought, acquired from an English family who sold it, and they, they claimed that it was presented to their ancestor in the late 1800s um, by the Sultan of Zanzibar for services rendered. So, a necklace with an interesting story. Now, um, I've put this in because it's such an exquisite group collection of jewelry and it's a collection of the Emir of Bukhara um, and um, most of the jewelry is enamel work of course this would have been women by, uh, worn by the women folk um, the men might have worn the belts and we have some daggers and swords that came with the collection and um, this must have passed out of the family after that part of the world became uh, came under the uh, Soviet Union. And so uh, it's a very interesting piece of uh, collection of jewelry, but some of it, I think, is fit to be worn by an elephant because <laughs> these are huge. So I think it might have been worn unless he had a big wife, I don't know. And so, yeah, that's worth looking at. And um, uh, Bukhara enamel work is, uh, um, has a lot of influences from India and from Persia. But they also say uh, maybe the greatest influence was from Russian enamel work. Um, as you, uh, you all know, I'm sure um, Russia produces uh, fantastic enamel work. And that's just, I mean, this is huge. It's, uh, it's around this big. So very difficult to stick around one's neck. Oh, I've put this door in because um, originally, I, I remember I said I put this door at the beginning of the lecture. And um, I wanted to tell you a lot about this door because there was a big adventure that went into um, establishing w what period it was made. And um, basically, Geza and sometimes my father, they traveled to Egypt, to Lebanon, to Riyadh, to Budapest, to Oxford, all in this trail of establishing that, that this was actually a Mamluk door. Now, the door has, it weighs, uh, it's a huge door. Um, it weighs, each leaf weighs one ton, and Dr. Geza established through his research and also analysis of um, different parts of the door um, that it came from 
this mosque, Sultan Barqouk Mosque, which is in disrepair in the 19th century. And that's the interior. This is a mosque in later years. Of course, minus the doors. I'm sorry, I'll go back, go back a bit. I've got two minutes left, so I'll just whiz through the last few items because I'd like you to see the two paintings at the end. So um, a very interesting story of Dr. Geyser's big three-year adventure. Um, this I put in just because it's so beautiful. I've, none of us have ever seen one anywhere in the world like it. It's made of buffalo hide, and it's intricately and beautifully carved. Uh, again, this is from the, the Mughal period. A beautiful musical instrument carved out of ivory. It's called a sarinda. It's got a lot of symbolism in all the animals that are busy chomping on each other. The, the phoenix eating the elephant, devouring. I'll skip that. I gave you a lecture about all these a couple of years ago. So I was going. I, I just put this in as the last thing. It's not Islamic art. This is Orientalism. It's these are paintings painted by a famous. Um, German Orientalist called Karl Haag. But the interesting thing is the person, and uh, um, people who find out who she is are always very interested, especially Europeans, but also people from this part of the world. This is a, an English aristocratic woman born in the early 1800s, married an English lord who abused her, so she ran away from him, and she left a son behind. And then she, can, she went on a long adventure of elopements and marriage and divorce. She married German princes, Austrian princes, Greek brigands, Albanian barons, and, and then she ended up one day when she was 50 in, in uh, Damascus, where she met this love of her life, and she married him. He was around 15 or 20 years younger than her, and she lived with him until she died. She's buried in Damascus. She had a beautiful house in Damascus, and um, her favorite thing was going on the um, going camping around Palmyra, which they did in the right season, much as Kuwaitis like to go and camp in the desert these days. And so that's Lady Jane Digby, and a uh, very interesting story there. And thank you very much.